So here we are together in uh, Dublin at uh, Rory Cowan Studios, and <laughs> I have a few questions. Uh, Avery these, Citron. These, these are the questions that Avery, um, my pal who produces all these videos, he's after coming up with a load of questions. And the only thing I said to him was, don't let me know in advance what they are. So what you're hearing now is just, oh, I don't know. It's going to be the actual reactions to the questions for the very first time you're hearing them. Okay, off you go, Avery. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, so what's your first memory? Ah, oh, that's all right. Um, my first memory, uh, let me see. I can distinctly remember sitting on a swing in the back garden in Ballyfermot. I couldn't have been more than three, four years of age, but I distinctly remember it, and I was singing the young ones, the Cliff Richard song. The young ones, darling, with the young ones. And the woman next door, Mrs. Houlihan, our next door neighbours were the McGarry's, but Mrs. McGarry's mother lived with them, Mrs. Houlihan, so she was an elderly lady. And she used to sit at her back window all day. And she, after, after me singing the young ones, and I only knew the, the, the chorus of it, I didn't know any more of it, um, she would say to me, Rory, um, sing something else. And I would sing, she loves you, the Beatles. But all I knew on that was, she loves you, yeah, 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 she loves you. I only knew that line. So eventually she'd get tired of me singing that. So she'd call me in and say, oh, lovely singer, very good singer. And she'd give me a sup of stout. <laughs> Because in those days, Guinness was good for you. And then she'd let me out her front door and say, go out and play on the street. So she'd get a bit of peace, the poor woman, when I think of her, me screaming my head off on a swing in the back garden. But that's a dis very distinctive memory I have. Ah, yeah. Ah, so, yeah. There you go. So what were you like as a child? <laughs> I was a tearaway, um, really. Uh, because in those days, as most people watching this will know, in those days, you didn't stay in you were out to play in the outside um, you just had to go out and, the, and that was mainly to do because the mothers wanted the house tidy they didn't want a load of kids running around so you'd come in from school or whatever and it would be get out and play and don't come back until tea time or don't come back until the lights come on on the road so when you're out um, even though all, if you were playing on the street all the, there was always hell ones out of women that would be keeping an eye on you and uh, it wouldn't be any problem for those women to give you a slap if you were misbehaving and your mother wouldn't object to some other mother hitting you. Um, so a lot of times those we wouldn't be watched. We used to go up and play in an old graveyard and uh, we'd be getting up to mischief. And that's what we did. I remember one day um, when we were kids, somebody suggested, and I can still, this is another memory, a very distinctive memory I have. Somebody suggested, let's all say curses. And of course, none of us had ever swore before. We had never told any, we'd never cursed. And with that, we started. And we were falling around the place laughing. And women going by, because we weren't near where we lived, women going by were tut-tutting and they're disgraceful and their mothers should be ashamed of themselves, dragging up those kids. And we thought this was hilarious. And we spent a good hour just thinking up of courses and going back over courses. And ro kids just roared and laughing. It was... It was it, Anyway, that was it. <laughs> well, that sort of brings me to yeah. the next question. Oh, what okay. childhood games did you play? Well, that's really part of it. Ah, well, the childhood games. We used to, there's things that nobody would know about anymore. Relievio, we used to play, um, which was basically chasing, and there was a den, and if you caught somebody, they had to go there, and then the other people on your team had to try and release you. We used to play what's called beds, but that's like hopsco a version of hopscotch, where you'd have a tin filled with uh, muck out of the garden, and then you'd play bed that would be like hopscotch and you do that we called it beds and uh, marbles was a big one um, and then there was one that nobody outside of ireland would really understand by the name but in ireland we called it the mel um, and that was you'd open a water shore like a little the little shores for the water outside on the street and you'd toss pennies at it and if you got the pennies in and then you had to try and chip other pennies in and then if you you'd win the money now, that was seen as gambling, so it was illegal, and the police used to come around, and they'd take the money, and they'd take your names and addresses, and you could end up in court for that. But it was called playing the Mel, and uh, we used to do that when we were kids. Totally illegal. Another one we used to do, and my favourite thing was, I loved it, um, and how we didn't end up getting killed, I don't know. Um, you would have a rope, and you would wrap it around the lamppost, and you would swing, sit into it and swing. But you'd jump off the railings, and you'd go backwards, and duck around and things like that and so a lot of times your head would bang off the lamppost but you actually could have been killed you wouldn't kids wouldn't be allowed to do that now but in our day that's what happened and then we could swim in the canal there was this canal near us um at the back of valley fair up on kymore road 
and we used to swim there in the summer and there'd be nobody watching us you just dive in and you wouldn't know what it'd be in that canal but anyway that's only worth thinking about now but at that time we didn't think of it we had great times we were never bored um, so that's really what, that's what our games were at the time they're all made up games there was no such thing as a computer game or there was no such thing as anything like that it was just make your own amusement because we had no money so we didn't have many toys and what toys we had we cherished um, so usually they would stay at home unless it was a bike or something like that but everybody had a bike and people used to make trolleys they used to make trolleys out of little wheels with ball bearings in them and planks of wood and you'd, 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 you'd be ah, pushing yeah. each other and that was what would happen you'd push each other and there was no brakes on it or anything like that and if a car came you'd have to try and swerve to get out of the way and the only way when you'd swerve you'd to, to stop was actually to crash into something um, so again, dangerous sports for kids, but we had a great time. No health and safety. Arm. No health and safety in those days. No health and safety in those days, for God's sake, nothing and, at all. <laughs> and I remember the gold kart thing was in all the yeah. comics and everything. Mm. So, what music did you like at different ages, shall we say? Ah, now in the sixties, I loved the female singers. I just, just loved them. Sandy Shaw was my absolute favourite. I adored Sandy Shaw, still do. Um, but in the sixties, I loved her. There was Sandy Shaw, Scylla Black, Lulu, um, Dusty Springfield. Uh, there was there was a lot of Dionne Warwick. I loved Petula Clark. I, there was I, female singers I really, really liked in the 60s. Um, it was only in the 70s that things changed. I, like, I remember, some of you might remember this song. It was by a band called, oh, what were they called? Middle of the Road. And they had a hit, a number one hit, a massive hit in 1971 called... Chirpy, chirpy, cheep, cheep. Now, I thought that was a brilliant song. At the time, I thought this was fabulous. But it was replaced at number one by Get It On by T-Rex. So when the T-Rex, when I heard T-Rex for the first time, that, that song for the very first time, it totally changed my life. Chirpy, chirpy, cheep, cheep, which the day before I thought was the best song around, became a frisbee, straight out the window, never to be played again. T-Rex changed my life completely, and it changed how I looked at music. Mark Boland, if he'd have said, right, you've got to come and follow me, leave your parents, leave your family, just come and follow me, I'd have went. I'd have been gone like a light. Um, and it's sort of, with T-Rex, it led me into, a, like the glam rock, it led me into things like David Bowie and Roxy Music, Mott the Hoople, um, loads of other bands like that. And friends then, other people that I knew when I went to different schools, they would have depending on what bands they liked, you would be, like if someone liked Alvin Stardust at the time, he was, di like, I wouldn't want to be friendly with them. It'd have to be somebody who liked the same band. So we be it, it became a great thing for meeting people. You'd see somebody with a, a school band and it might have Roxy music on it. So you'd think, I'd probably, I'd like them. I could be friends with them. And you would seek people out based on the music that they liked. And that's what, that's, T-Rex for me was massive. Then in 19, I remember 1973, I really got into the Beatles. I wasn't too much aware of them before that. I knew bits of things, but I wasn't. But the Red and the Blue, 1960, the, the Red and the Blue double albums of their com compilation of their hits came out. And I got both of them. And I thought, 1973 was brilliant for double albums. There was the Red and the Blue by the Beatles. And there was also Good by Yellow Brick Road by Elton John. And those albums, I just, I still love. I still revisit them. I still play them to this day. Um, the Beatles, that got me into the Beatles and I wanted to hear everything they recorded after those two albums were released. And Elton John's album was just amazing. Uh, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. It still sounds fresh. It's got every different type of music you could think of on it. There's dance music, there's ballads, there's reggae, um, country. There, like it's, it's, it's all there on that album. It's the uh, that album, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, is a perfect album. There's not a dull track on it. It's fantastic. Um, so those were the main ones. After that, then I got into Kate Bush, who I adored, and um, I got into so much music after that. Um, but especially when I worked in the record shop, I got into the Doors and whatever. So now these days, I spent. I find that I'm collecting vinyl again. So most of, most of the stuff that I like, it's stuff from before. I listen to very new, very few new music so, tracks. Sorry, I'm getting the I'm broken here. Excuse me. <laughs> Frog me throat. <laughs> Better than toad in the hole, isn't it? <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, so it's a different subject now anyway. Okay. Are you okay there? Or yeah. yeah, yeah. So did you have a family pet? Um 
in, uh, we always had dogs in our house, and I was never a dog lover. No, I wouldn't do any harm to a dog. Um, but they were always mutts, except for one, Rusty. He was a, he was a boxer, and he came from a litter of prize boxers that they were in shows, in dog shows. He couldn't be shown because he had two dark marks on his back. So um, I remember my dad was able to buy him for four pound, and we had him, and he lived with lived with us until he died about fourteen or fifteen years later. I was a teenager then, and actually I remember when he died, he had to be put down, and I didn't. Um, I could hear my mother roaring crying downstairs, and I came running. I was upstairs, and I came running down. She'd come in with my father, and she was roaring crying, and I thought, oh my God, someone in the family is dead, or sister is dead, or somebody's dead. And I ran down and I says, what's going on? She says, oh, Rusty's gone. And I thought, oh, okay. Um, she saw the dog as part of the family. I was never like, I never had that relationship or, or I never saw dogs that way. Um, I was never a dog person. For me now, it's cats. And now I've got four cats that come to visit me. I don't own any of them, but I have four cats. My favourite is Ructions, of course. And I talk to him. Um... You all know Ructions because I've been putting photographs up, but I talk to him all the time and I understand exactly what he wants, when he wants it and by, by where he sits. I have a perfect understanding of that cat. So I love cats. I'm not a dog person. Wouldn't harm a dog, wouldn't do any, wouldn't condone any cruelty to dogs or anything like that, but I really love cats. Cats are the ones for me. But growing up, we always had dogs. And in school, uh, were your school days the best of your life? Not at all. <laughs> I, I didn't like school. Um, I liked the friends I had there, and I liked the laugh I had with my friends. But school itself, I never felt that I was... I must have learned it. I must have learned stuff all right, but I never felt um, the school itself was a good time. I never enjoyed the learning part. I never enjoyed any of the subjects. I did like history, but... Um, I, it's, it's very difficult if you, if you really like a subject and you're very good at it like I was with history and English if you're very good at it that's great but there's always going to be someone in the class who's behind like if it was that, that would be me with Irish so that person like me with Irish I would hold everybody else back because the teacher would have to be trying to keep me up to speed so they, they would be spending more time on me trying to learn Irish to keep up with the rest of everybody else and then everybody else gets bored to death because they're waiting on me and they know where they are. And it was the same for me with English and history. If there was somebody lagging behind. So if it was up to me now, I would just say one teacher for one pupil. <laughs> because that's the only way you could enjoy learning in school. That's the only way you could do it, I think. Because in some subjects you're going to be great and someone's going to be holding you back because they, they're behind. And in other subjects you're going to be, they're going to be great and you're going to be holding them back. So it's it's quite a difficult way like that. So but anyway, school, I was delighted to get out of it. And were, were you uh, quite impatient? You wanted to get it over with. Oh, I wanted to get out of school immediately. I tried to leave before my intercert or junior cert, it's called now. I tried to leave at fourteen, uh, and get a job as a trainee hairstylist, an apprentice hairstylist, and my mother wouldn't. She nearly lost her reason, um, because she had to leave school at fourteen herself, and she was insistent that she had to leave because in those days you had to pay. For for secondary school education but then the law came in that it was free up until leave insert so my mother was determined that her children were going to go to leave insert at least leave insert maybe if they wanted to go to university after that we'd work that out but at least leave insert so when i wanted to leave she wasn't having any of it and then the idea she was a retrade union woman the idea of me doing any job for six pound a week sweeping up um hair that somebody had cut off somebody else's head the idea of that, just thought, under no circumstances are you doing that. No, you're going to stay in school. So I ended up staying in school after we leaving Sarah. But the day it finished, I was out there and I never looked back. <laughs> and I don't look back in the fondly either. Do you know what I mean? If there were school reunions, I, I've never went to one. So I was just glad to get out. And were you bullied in school? Or? Not at all. I was never bullied. Um, I do hear a lot of, and God love them, I hear a lot of gay people saying, that they were bullied. Um, it never happened to me because nobody knew. I, I hid it very carefully. And the reason I hid it very carefully was that in my school in Dundrum, there was two guys, they were good friends. Now I know myself they weren't gay. I knew that they weren't gay. They were just very good friends. 
But the word went round that they were gay and they were battered, they were beaten, senseless. So I thought, oh, okay, I'm staying here. I'm, I'm staying in this closet. Those doors are going to be shut tight and then nobody's going to find out. But I had found out years beforehand um, when I made my mother laugh. Um, I, I dawned on me, if you can make people laugh. So I was always a joker in school. I was always up for a bit of messing. So if you could make people laugh, they're not going to hit you. They're not going to, they're not going to um, attack you. And so I always did that. I was like the class clown and um, one of the class clowns. And so people used to enjoy being in my company because I was a good laugh. And I would never, I, there was never fear of anything. I never got afraid of getting caught doing something. Um, so I was fine. That was, that worked out, that, that, that really worked out for me. But there were some people that were bullied and you, you hear terrible stories of people getting bullied for having red hair, being good in school, um, wearing glasses, being small, being tall, and um, coming from a different part of the country. Um, the, and it's, thank God now, or thank God then, we didn't have um, the internet because that, from what I believe, that is, that is just dreadful. Um, and I hear because I'm talking to people, because there's a charity I support here called Shyline, and I support that, and I hear some terrible stories. And it breaks your heart because it's children, and, it's, and children can be very cruel to other children. Um, I'm sure I probably was cruel to other children growing up and whatever, but things just rolled off me. I, never, I was never really bullied, bullied, so that's it, you know. And uh, what were your favourite TV programmes? Favourite TV programmes? Well, we're going back to the 60s and the 70s. In the 70s, it was definitely Top of the Pops. That was the one thing you couldn't miss. Top of the Pops, you couldn't miss. Every Thursday night, half seven. Unbelievable. In the 60s, when I was a kid... Actually, now that I think of it, when I was in... I love things like Get Smart, The Avengers. That was my favourite in the 60s. Uh, the Man from Uncle. I loved type of spy things um, like that. Uh, I never got into Doctor Who, life in space and coming from another planet. That never interests me. It still doesn't. I have no interest in it. But um, I liked those type of shows. They seemed to be exciting. And there was always a big fight. And I loved Emma Peel, Diana Reid. I thought she was great. She was always beating the shite out of somebody. And she was fabulous. And she looked great. She looked really elegant. The women in the 60s looked stunning. You had Diana Rigg, who was Emma Peel. She was fantastic. And Sandy Shaw, as I said, and all the other female singers. Nancy Sinatra, I loved her as well. They all looked so stylish and so stunning. And they looked so much different to the girls and the women that lived around where I lived. So it was like television was and music was like a magical area that to go into. And that's so... But those were the, those were the type of programmes I loved in the 60s. Then in the 70s, it was just Top of the Pops. That was the one I kept. Within these walls was another one. Um, I remember there was an actress called Googie with her. She was a, uh, the prison warder in a women's prison. And that was very good. So there was, there was, there was, a, there was a few, but the ones that stand out now. Top of the Pops and the Avengers. and loved them. Um, did you have any idea what you wanted to be when you grew up? None whatsoever. I always said when I was younger, I was out, as a child... My mother tell, tells me I was always singing. Um, I was a really happy child. I was always singing. And um, I do remember if anyone said to me, what do you want to be if you grow up? I, I said I wanted to be a singer. And they all laugh a bit, but they say, oh, you'd be great. You'd be fantastic. I always got encouraged all the time. And if I said it, until I decided to, when I did leave school, then I wasn't encouraged in the job that I wanted to do. But while I was in school, while I was young, and I said I want to do this, everyone was very supportive of me. So I wanted to be a singer, but I never wanted to be... We had a career guidance teacher in our school and he called us all in one day, one by one, and he said, what do you want to be? And I said, I want to do something in music. And he said, that's a ridiculous waste of time getting a job doing that. He said, uh, it's an office job you should try for, civil service or... Uh, and this... This is probably what he was saying to everybody, and it was like, if these are the expectations for men and women, women to be you know, going to a typing pool and typing school and learn how to type so they could become secretaries or work. And this was, career guidance teachers was a great job because it was money for all rope. They actually weren't helping anybody. They were just there, but they weren't actually helping anyone. So um, I never really knew what I wanted to do until I got a job working in a record shop. And then I thought, this is what I want to do. 
And I still say it to this day, my best job was ever was working in a record shop that EMI owned. And I was earning £21.50 a week and I was so happy because I, I would have done that job for nothing because it was a hobby of mine, just listening to music. I was never sporty, um, but I did love music. And getting a job in a record shop was my dream job. And then I ended up getting promoted and things worked out because I was in a job that I liked and things really worked out. But growing up, I never had any idea what I wanted to do. And how could you? You're going to change your mind all the time anyway. And do you remember your first kiss? Oh, I do. I'm not meaning to ask. You know. <laughs> it's cheeky. <laughs> My first kiss. That was, I was in Limerick. I was about 12 years of age. And the girl's name was Ruth. I remember that very, very well. And we were kissing. And I thought, this is okay. I kissed quite a few girls in the, a few years after that. And I thought take it I leave it didn't it didn't do anything for me it wasn't unpleasant but it wasn't knocking me sideways either and um, when I kissed my first boy that was completely different I wanted to do that again <laughs> I should have known then at 14 years of age or 13 years of age 14 years of age I was I think when I kissed the first boy I should have known then because it was just different and I really should have known then I I think I did but it, I actually didn't do anything about it. I didn't go on the gay scene or I didn't meet other gay people until a few years after that. But um, that was... That, oh God, I'm really telling all my secrets now, am I? <laughs> so, I kissed girls and... Um, so your first fine. love was a man then? No, no, no. My first love... Um, I guess me who my first love was, isn't it? Yeah. Is that, oh, God. My first love... Let me think. My first love... Uh, it would have been a man, and um, I remember his name was Andrew. I won't go into any more details about that. I don't see him anymore. I don't know where he is. He's probably not even in Ireland. Um, ended up being a cheap bastard. <laughs> um, but I, I, I liked being with him at the time. But when I say is it love, it probably, of course it wasn't. We were only together for a couple of months. And then it finished, and um, he had told me he had been with somebody else the night before, and to me that was the end of it, because I'm one of these people. I know there's people, guys and girls, that can go out and they can go with loads of different... When you're single, you can go with whoever you like, and you can have as many people as you like, do what you like, whatever. But when you're in a relationship, I have, I've never cheated on anybody that I was going out with, ever. I've never done it. And... I don't know why other people do. A lot of people do. I don't. I've never done it. And I'm not passing judgment on anybody. It's just for me, I don't. And if somebody's with me and they cheat and I find out about it, that's just the end of the relationship. It's, 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 it's over. There's no, for me, there's no going back. And maybe I'm probably too strict on myself and too strict on other people. I don't really know because here I am, nearly 60 years of age and I'm single. But I don't accept people in relationships going off with somebody else so but I haven't been in that many relate I don't want one um so I there's never really been a love in my life um he was probably the first one I was really into but it wasn't love it was just anyway there you go okay and uh, what was the most important thing in the world to you oh no the most, uh, you see I know that's a question that if anybody else was asked, they would say uh, their partner, their children, their mother, their father. So to answer that, it would probably be a boring answer that everybody else would give. The most important thing in my life is to be, um, be supposed to be happy. That's probably boring as well, but I, would, I just want to be happy. in my, And I am. I'm very, very happy in my life. I have always been happy um, because... Things that make me unhappy, I'll get rid of them, or I'll dump them, or I'll walk away from them. Um, I don't entertain unhappiness for very long anyway. Um, so, I, I, to get me through the day, I have to be happy with the, with the whole day. And I am. I try, I try my best. You've got, to, you've got to work at being happy. <laughs> because if you sit around doing nothing, you, you can become maudlin. Um If you go out and you're, you're, you can take people live take what they say literally and just get into arguments with people so you've really got to work not to do that 
Um, so I don't hang about. I do, like, I listen to music. I'm always doing something. Um, and that, as a result, I'm happy. So happiness is very, very important. I think if you're not happy, you'll end up in an early grave. Not me. I'm going to live to be 160. <laughs> in my <me> dreams. <laughs> <laughs> What, what did else? you, talking about clothes, uh, what did you wear then that you wouldn't wear now? Oh God, everything. In the 70s now, what I, things I'd wear, there'd be elephant flares, platform shoes, um, real t skin tight t-shirts, um, which I couldn't wear now, not with the belly I have. And you'd have uh, cheesecloth, cheesecloth shirts, which you wouldn't wear them either. And Afghan coats. Oh, I used to love Afghan coats. I wouldn't put one near me now. They used to stink the hell if you were caught out in the rain in them. They used to smell. <laughs> because they were basically the hides of cattle. And they were the hides of cattle, and that's what it was. And uh, when the rain hit them, it was like the smell of a, a cow. Um, so, but we used to love them in the 70s. We all used to have them. And patchouli oil, we used to have. And I think, Jesus, and they stink the place out. Um, so those things, actually, basically, I've, if clothes, they come in and out of fashion, and if something comes into fashion that you used to wear years ago, you don't wear it now, because it would have suited you years ago, it's not going to suit you now. You've got older, those fashions, they've just come back and they're still the same as they were years ago. If you, if you wore it first time around, it's not going to suit you second time around. So there's basically nothing that I wore in the 70s that I would wear now, absolutely nothing. Nothing. I, lo I loved the clothes then. wouldn't put them on my back now. Well, not on the subject of clothes, but um, have you changed from your teenage self? I wouldn't say much. <laughs> <laughs> I d att in attitudes, I, I, like I've got older, but I still have that same attitude I had when I was a teenager. I, d I don't think that's changed. Politically, I've, well, everybody does as they get older. I've, in my teenage years, I couldn't care less about politics. None of it interested me. And even the ban the bomb or the peace campaigns, they never interested me at all when I was a teenager. But as you get older, politically, you become more aware. Um, but my attitude to life um, and how to get through the day, that's still the exact same as it was when I was a teenager. I always do exactly what I want to do. I always do what I think is going to be best for myself. When I was younger, um, I always thought, I was very determined on what I was going to do and what I wasn't going to do. And I'm still like that now. And nothing will persuade me to do anything I don't want to do. Uh, as I said, um, the careers guidance teachers, when they were saying, do this or do that. And my mother was even the same. Get a job in the bank. Didn't, wasn't, I wasn't going to do anything like that. Career guidance teachers, I think everybody should, if they had the attitude that I had, which is only do what you want to do, you'll end up with a great job. You'll end up with a job that you love. You'll end up looking forward to getting up in the morning and going to work. And that's, I've never had a single day going to work that I didn't, that I thought, oh, I really can't stand going in here today. I can't stand it. Um, there were, I've been in jobs where when you get there, something's happening, you're going, oh, I wish I wasn't here today. But not very often. The job itself I liked. Um, so I'm still as determined as I was, and I won't do anything I don't want to do. When I was in school, and my father was fluent Irish, my sister's a... Vice principal in an all Irish school. My nephews all, are all fluent Irish, and my sister herself is fluent Irish. I couldn't string two words of Irish together, and the reason I couldn't in school, I knew that I would never need Irish for what I was going to do, so I just didn't bother learning it. It was the same with geography. Um, they would say things like, I remember in the geography class we were taught about what the people in Korea would eat. I couldn't care less what the people in Korea eat. No more than I'm sure they care what I'm eating. It didn't interest me because I knew I was never going to be working in an, in an industry that dealt with what the people in Korea were eating. So I just, science was another thing, just went by me. I had no interest whatsoever because I knew I was never going to work in the sciences. So what, I was always very aware that young, that if, of something that was not going to be of any use to me, so I didn't bother with it. And the subjects that I did like and that I did think I was going to do, like music, I used to love that. We did that as a subject in school. Art I loved. English I loved. History I loved. Um, so those ones I really got into. Um, and I'm still the same now. If there's something I'm not interested in, I might try it, but very quickly I'd say, no, that's not for me. And don't put, I don't. So I'm useless at quizzes because general knowledge just goes over my head because 
I know what I know, and the things that I don't know, I'm not interested in, <laughs> or the subjects that I don't know, I'm not interested in, so huh? I'd be useless in the pub quiz. So where did you go on holiday? Uh, as a child, we used to go to Rush, which is a seaside town about 30 miles outside Dublin. And I loved, as a child, they were just magnificent holidays. I loved them. Um, so we would go down there every year and get a caravan. And God, when I think of it, there was always going to be, there was myself, my brother, my sister, my mother, my father, my auntie Eileen, uh, a dog, Rusty, the boxer. And then there'd be either my cousin Grania or my cousin Mary. So there was a load of us in a small caravan. But, and all day long we'd be down on the beach. So that was great. Then when I got older and started going on holidays, I've had holidays all over the world now, but my, the one place that I always go back to is Tel Aviv in Israel. I love that city. I can't tell you how much I love that city. I went there first in 1979 and I had a ball. It was a city that just suited me. Um, and it still does. I can't put my finger on what it is about it, but it's a city that really, really suits me. And if I was to live anywhere else except Ireland, it would be Tel Aviv. I just adore that city, and I keep going back. I've been there a couple of times this year, and I'm going again next year. For, I'd be going, like, it's, I just keep going back all the time. It's my holiday destination of choice. I have a great time there. It's got everything you could want in a holiday. Um, restaurants, nightlife, beaches, sun, fabulous people beautiful people and it's just it's, whatever you want to do you'll find it there so that's what I love so I go to Tel Aviv as a child it was Rush as an adult it's Tel Aviv <laughs> so do you think the young you would be pleased with the adult you oh I think the young me would be very pleased with the adult me I, de I definitely think so because the young me was always the young me had to fight to be, had to fight, how do I put this? Everybody was trying to give advice to the young me and the advice was very well meaning and I disregarded every bit of it. And that's a good thing for somebody young to be able to do that, but I did. And I would hate for the young me to look at the old me and say, just settle for second best, just settle for something that you didn't really want to do. Um, you lower your standards as you got older. I think the young me would love that I'm still exactly like I was, the young me. I think the young me would just say, you know what, you've done all right, you did great, you did very well, and you never, ever lowered your standards on and what you wanted to do. Conversely, if you could go back in time, what would you tell your 15-year-old self? What i tell my 15-year-old? Well, when I was 15... 16, 17, I knew I was gay. I was still going out with girls. Um, I would say to my 15 year old self, stay on the patch you're on, it's going to do you well. Your gut instinct about what you want to do in your life, that will serve you well, more than any advice. So stay on that path. But I would have said to him, listen, there's a gay community out there just waiting on you. Um, all you have to do is go to us. They can't find you, but you can find them. Just go to a gay bar, go to a gay club. You will meet gay people and you will end up with having the best. Just realise that you're, you're going out with girls, they're only going to be friends. And you can have great friends that are girls, but they're never going to be adding more than that because you're not going to be like that. That's what, my fifth, that's what I would love to say to my 15-year-old self. I would have saved myself five or six years of doing that. I'm probably hurting girls by breaking up with them and them not knowing why and um, so I regret that so I would say to him just be true to yourself there's a scene out there go and find it um, because in a few years you will go out and you'll meet people like Ken and Robert who are friends of mine um, I met them on the gay scene 35 years ago um, more more than 35 years ago if I hadn't been gay I never would have met them and they're the two best friends anybody could ever want Avery is as well but it was a while after I, before I met Avery um, but Ken and, and Robert not I on the gay scene he wasn't on the gay scene <laughs> let's make that clear <laughs> oh yeah no Avery's not gay <laughs> he's definitely not gay um, and I'm not hiding it <laughs> but I met um, Ken and Robert and they were the best friends I could and I never would have met them if I was straight so I would say to the younger me, there's a, there's a gay community out there. And I'd say to any young person, any teenager who, has thing, who knows that they're gay but haven't come out yet, 
go to the gay go onto the gay scene in some way there's going to be a young pair persons program on where you meet other young gay people if you're too young to get into bars but just go you will meet fabulous people and you will have a lovely happy life if you just do that if you do that if you try and hide it you'll be miserable you'll make girls miserable um it's 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 not worth it i would have said to my younger self don't be worrying don't worry about anything because when i did eventually come out none of my friends cared less and that was the one thing that used to concern me if i come out and i tell them will they uh will they still be my friends um Will I be dumped? I'll have no friends at all. Will it be slagged off? Will it become a nightmare? Uh, but of course, when I told them, uh, I waited until I had other good friends like Ken and Robert, um, because then I thought, well, if my straight friends dump me, I have good friends as well that are gay. So it would be okay. But what happened was I told them, and they thought this was the best news they had ever heard in their life. They were delighted to have a gay friend. All my friends, like when I think Sean and Annette, Sean Dawson and Annette, Wall, who's now Annette Carroll, and they're still great friends of mine today. They didn't care less, and I was thinking I should have, I could have told them years beforehand, um, but for some reason I didn't. And uh, but when I did tell them, they actually didn't care, and they couldn't have been more supportive. And they were all my friends that I told. They were ringing everybody, and when you look at it now, it's not even politically correct. But they'd be on the phone because it was in my apartment. And I told them, and they were ringing every. Come here, you won't believe who's queer. Rory, <laughs> come on down, we're celebrating. <laughs> so it ended up in my apartment with gangs of people all delighted with the news. And but what I did find was there was a lot of girls that came down. And before these were lovely looking girls that everybody was after. So you didn't. I never stood a chance with them. But as soon as I came out, it was like. It was weird. I had these gorgeous looking girls throwing themselves at me and my straight friends couldn't believe it. They were saying, How t- <laughs> there's, there's something wrong with you, blah, 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 that you don't find them attractive and you could have them. They, 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 they're they throwing their offering to you on a plate. But what it was, was they couldn't understand. Um, I, this sounds weird, but I think that they couldn't understand at the time. I was the only gay person that they knew. And they couldn't understand that there could be a man that didn't find these girls attractive. So they were trying to come on to me so as I would and but I wasn't interested and I think they they all thought then that all he needs is a good woman and they all thought that they were the good woman that was going to sort me out but they didn't so now I'm just friends with everybody and it's great and I've, so back to the what was the question me 15 year old self was it yeah, yeah you've explained know. that well enough so I think that's yeah that'll do <laughs> so to your your fans all around the world in Canada the US Australia Europe and the UK and Ireland Anything else you'd like to say, or apart from a big buy, or maybe show them around your kitchen? Um, I know. I just decided this time I'm going to do the, the, the video here in my kitchen. My kitchen's in the front of the house, and you're only seeing a small corner of it. So what can you see? Through here? the there's coffee machine. Oh, there's my Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. See this one? That's my Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band biscuit tin. I got that in the Beatles uh, shop in Liverpool years ago. Then we me fruit. Oh, look it up here. Aren't these fabulous? Look at them, these mugs with the little happy emojis on them. Angry, I don't know what that, oh, that's kiss. That's very happy. That's crying with laughter. That's rolling the eyes. Oh God, I can do that myself. <laughs> and then that's really, just look at me. I'm, I'm, I'm the future's so bright, I've got to wear shades. Um, what else, the, the zombie bacon stuff. I've started bacon, you won't believe this. So the zombie bacon stuff here, I make bread. Um, so I make, um, what type of bread do I make? Soda bread. Soda bread. <laughs> Couldn't remember. <laughs> so I bake, I bake me on bread, and then there's another coffee thing there, and then there's all me for me juices, um, because I juice all the all, quite a lot now with all the, fruit, and vegetables, and so that's it. So that's all you can see here now. There, there's more of the kitchen up there. You'll see more of the next. That's time. a lovely bright spot here I with know. all the all the open windows to I just wanted, light you up. Yeah, I just wanted to do because I usually I'm sitting at the table. It's a good idea. Good idea. I just thought well we'll change something. Actually, it's not my idea. It was average. He was saying that the videos were getting boring doing them all in the same place. <laughs> I'm always pushing for a different location, but uh, you came up with the idea today. And well done. So anyway, there you are. And now I'm going to go out for my walk. Because I've got, as you know, I think I told you all before, I've type two, I've, I'm a type 2 diabetic, type 2 diabetes. And I have to watch what I eat, which is fine. But one of the things that I have to do is walk every day. They tell me that if there is any build up a sugar at all in your body, walking will burn it off. 
So I've got to walk an hour, an hour and a half every day. So I'm off from your walk now. So there you go. Listen, all the best. Sorry if this rambled on a bit, but I hope you like it anyway. See you. Have a great weekend. And I'll talk to you very, very soon. All the best. Bye-bye.